Welcome everyone, this is the Greenfield Public Schools Special School Committee meeting. It's Tuesday, July 6, 2021, uh, at 6 p.m. We're at Greenfield High School for a superintendent candidate interview uh, with uh, Dr. Christine DeBarge. And we'll move right into the agenda for tonight. We'll do have Secretary Johnson Musa do a roll call of the members in attendance. Member Karen. Here. Vice Chair Ekstrom. Present. Member Hollins. Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm here. Chair Proietti. Here. Member Wall. Here. Mayor Wiedegardner. We have a quorum. Great, thank you. So I'll call us to order at 6.02 p.m. and we'll move right into the interview. Again, it's our superintendent finalist, Christine DeBarge. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. And just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, uh, Mayor Wiedegardner did have some questions that were assigned to her uh, for tonight, and um, they are going to be handled. Uh, question number three, I'm going to take. And question number eight is going to be taken by Vice Chair Ekstrom. And I'm going to assume that Member Hollins will actually attend before we assign her questions to other folks. We'll just wing it if that's not the case. Um, so I would like to introduce first our uh, finalist candidate tonight. Welcome, uh, Dr. Christine DeBarge, who I'm told prefers to be called Christine. I do, thank okay. you. Okay, and uh, we'll give you a chance to do uh, some opening remarks for us, and then we'll move into our question segment. All right. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you very much and uh, greatly enjoyed my first interview, so I was very pleased to be asked back. And um, as you can see from my resume, I've worked in public education for a number of years, and I have had the opportunity to have experiences in a variety of roles, including special education administration, assistant superintendent curriculum, and then the superintendency. And what I had learned about Greenfield and what I have had reinforced with all of the um, excellent meetings and opportunities to meet with members of the school community today, um, I feel very comfortable in saying that my experience, I believe, will be um, a positive addition to the Greenfield Public Schools. So I'm looking forward to answering your questions and talking with you a little bit to see um, if you feel the same. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so I have the first question, and we're gonna move, we have a total of 10 questions for you tonight, and I'll take the first one. And I think, I'm gonna keep kind of a, an eye on the time with the help of uh, Vice Chair Ekstrom, and we're, I would expect we'll finish between seven and 7.15, and if it looks like we're getting behind schedule on that, um, I might, well, you'll see. I have a style. That's fine. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So I have the first question. I'm curious if you knew anything about Greenfield or about Franklin County before applying for the job. And if yes, could you tell us a little bit about what you knew about this area? Sure. The, um, my experience in Franklin County has been um, twofold, but not extensive. One of the... Uh, ways I've had experience in Franklin County is when I worked for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education as a level four plan manager. I was fortunate to be assigned up in the Gil Montague School region. So for a year I worked in that area and was able to visit the schools, interact with the community, the school community up there. And um, so that was my formal time learning about Franklin County through the Gil Montague work. Um, informally, my family has, you know, had field trips up in this area, taken the kids to Richardson's Candies, which is a favorite, um, driven through here for the North Brookfield movies. So really any, you know, the primary exposure I've had to Franklin County has been recreational but it's a very appealing environment. I live in an area that's primarily rural. 
I like that um, smaller town feel. I do know that Greenfield has more population than where I live. You have more um, town, you have more city and more um, you know, restaurants and amenities, but it still has that small town feel to me. And that was one of the reasons that it was appealing to look to um, when the position was posted and then learning about the school community itself and the demographics here and some of the goals that you folks had shared when the position was posted made it all that much more appealing to consider applying for the position. Thank you. There will be an election for three of our seven school committee members in November. I have served on this committee for two years and during that time, our responsibilities have varied greatly. Could you envision the role of the school committee uh, member for us and why folks should get involved and run for election for the school committee? Okay. So I find that the members being a participant on the school committee is an extremely critical role because you folks set the path for the district. You envision how um, the philosophy will be set. You envision the priorities for that through your work with policy, through your work with budget. I mean, you direct all of the work by setting the path that the district needs to be on. So that it sounds like an awesome responsibility and I feel that it really is that um, you are setting the table for the learning and the experience of all the students in Greenfield. So I think people should consider getting involved if they have strong opinions one way or another about where the priorities should be, if they have had students in the district, if they currently have them in the district, if they have any interest in committee work or community leadership, I think that you have an incredible opportunity to really have an impact on where the Greenfield Schools goes, not just during the time of your term on the committee, but that sets a path for many generations in the future and establishes what opportunities your students have. And I think that really provides opportunities for where the students in Greenfield can go once they leave here. I think um, everyone would want the students to have an endless list of opportunities once they leave, whether it's vocation, service, college, um, anything. And that um, the school committee sort of sets that road. So, um, in terms of the role of the school committee, um, you know, you have a variety of very distinct roles, even more specific than setting the whole agenda for the schools. You know, making decisions about policy really reflects the philosophy of the committee, of the schools, of the town. Um, establishing those policies tells the superintendent how to focus resources how to establish regulations to implement that. With your budget work, you establish resources for the district, help reflect what the community priorities are through those budgetary decisions. You hire a superintendent who certainly you're hoping to have one that will reflect the philosophy of the community and yourselves as a committee. So it's really, um, it's an awesome opportunity to affect the future of Greenfield. So. Back to me again, only because the mayor isn't here. This was actually her question. Uh, the roles and responsibilities of schools, committees, and superintendents are sometimes clear and sometimes ambiguous. For example, budget approval versus bu budget implementation or personnel policy and finance versus personnel administration, or even dealing with parents and teachers with concerns or complaints. Can you describe some situations where these roles and responsibilities have challenged you? 
did it stop? Yeah. It went off. Yeah. Uh, where these, can you describe some situations where these roles and responsibilities have challenged you and how you would work to address them were you our superintendent? So in my experience, the role of the superintendent and the committee, there's some fluidity within those because we have to work as a team and there are guidelines for what decisions generally are dealt with by the superintendent and those dealt with by the committee. But in a lot of cases, um, we have to work together and we have to share a philosophy about especially the budget, for example. You know, I would be building a budget, but I need to follow the priorities that the school committee has set in strategic planning or goal setting with the superintendent. So I could not, should not build a budget that, you know, focuses on, I'll say, infrastructure as an example, when you folks clearly are setting priorities from an instructional standpoint. So I need to do that budget development in line with your priorities. Um, I need to provide you with the backup of why I'm proposing certain things within the budget, why resources are being recommended, where they are, what goals those will address, data to support those goals if, if appropriate. Um, and then during the budget, discussion, you know, again, my experiences, I would present my budget to you with the rationale for all of the line items, the big picture of the budget, and then you folks would be able to ask many questions about why we are proposing different additions, subtractions, and then it's your prerogative to make changes to those, whether it's from a financial standpoint, whether it's from a philosophical standpoint, um, you have the ability to do that. And then once, once a budget is approved, then um, it's the superintendent's job to implement that and to make the money that we have been given work to, for the best interest of our students, supporting the priorities that we agreed to when you approve the budget. You know, sometimes we have to modify grants, we have to buy pens instead of pencils. There's some modification as the year goes on and things happen, but in general, you know, I would need to execute the budget at least following the philosophy that you folks espoused. So I've been fortunate that generally that has worked well where um, I have been, but I have a very transparent conversation with the board about the excuse me, about the budget, and they have established a very clear strategic plan. So the guide for the budget creation is very clear. Um, we talk a lot across the course of the year, and I would expect to do the same with this committee about the needs of our students, the needs of the staff, data that supports what your priorities are and how we're moving on those. So my approach would be that when the committee sees the budget, proposal, it's no surprise, and you know why things are there and what data has been presented to support that. Um, certainly today I've heard very clearly that special education programming, um, safe school climate restorative practice and communication, and as well as core instruction are all priorities for the people that I have met with, and so clearly those would be some priority areas for the budget. Um, so, um, okay, okay. Um, personnel administration, um, my feeling is that belongs with the superintendent. The day-to-day -day supervision and evaluation of staff belongs with the superintendent and that there are times when challenges arise that may move to the committee level and that should that be the case, um, you folks really should not be involved in personnel discussions prior to, so that if you need to become involved in a situation, you are an objective body that can move through that process. Um, but you would be hiring me to be the instructional expert, to be the um, one who's ensuring that your plan is being implemented, and so 
I would need to be the one who's addressing situations that arise that are contrary to that plan and contrary to the best, you know, the best of our students. So to me, personnel administration would be clearly the superintendent's purview. Um, dealing with parents and teachers, um, I believe that there is a chain of command that should be followed in dealing with concerns and that concerns should be addressed closest to the concern as possible. So if a parent has a concern with a teacher, then the parent should talk with the teacher first to see if that concern can be resolved. If not, then it moves to the next level of authority. Generally the principal, sometimes the assistant or associate principal and then if the concern remains, or now there has been another concern added to that, then it could escalate to the superintendent's level. But I do not believe that the district is best served if we don't have communication at the closest level of the concern. Um, I feel the same way about parents and teacher complaints going to the school committee feel that they should be asked to follow the chain of command and that um, it would be good practice for committee members to ask that parents follow the same chain of command and staff do the same. Um, many times it's a complicated situation where no one in your position could ever be expected to know all the detail about what has happened. Um, that's not your that's not your role, it's reasonable that you would not know that. And many of the details that are involved in a situation have resulted in why communication has been, um, that's often the case, it's not always the case, but so it really, I think, is most effectively dealt with um, in that chain of command. The other piece to that is at times there are systemic issues that get unearthed when you are hearing a concern from a teacher or a parent. And then that's something that administratively needs to be looked at and then decided whether or not we need to change protocols process to prevent that type of issue from occurring again. If it should get to a policy decision, then certainly the committee would be involved at that point. So um, I think I've answered your question. I, I think you're good. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Student achievement is at the core of the public school system. In regard to performance, how would you use the data from our schools to prioritize the use of resources, including money, facilities, and human capital. Would this be collaborative, a discussion with the school committee and the public, and if so, how? So I believe that um, we should be using data whenever possible to make decisions about allocating any resources, whether it's personnel, monetary, materials, and that, um, Certainly that's something I would do as a priority here in Greenfield is look at all of the data that you have regarding all of the areas of focus that have been shared. And that includes visiting classrooms, it includes talking with teachers and other staff in the district to find out how things are working and to come to some consensus on what the priority areas are and then look at the areas of need. For example, I know that curriculum is one of the needs that's been talked about pretty consistently um, in my interviews and the visits today. So, you know, for, to use that as an example, to look at student performance data to identify areas of significant weakness and take those areas, look at the curriculum. Are they reflected adequately in the curriculum or do we need to make changes there? Is there an absence of resources to address those curriculum areas? So then we would need to look at what's an effective resource for that. Um, looking at professional development, how do we need to allocate 
district resources for professional development to address the needs the staff may have, which would affect student performance. Um, so it's a very um, linear process, at least at the beginning, but then to get input from teachers about, we may say this would be a wonderful resource for you to use, but maybe some of the staff has experience and it's not really as easy to use as what administratively we believe is the case. So I do think that getting input from stakeholders is very important um, before we make any big decisions about allocating resources. Facilities, you know, the community may prioritize particular programs or athletics, um, and then using that information, we may make decisions about how you put money, you know, maybe the community is more focused on the basketball court versus the outdoor track, and then you look to get um, input that way to focus resources. Um, I do utilize um, a pretty comprehensive system when looking at resource allocation and how do we make sure that we're supporting all of the pieces in an appropriate way because there's really no point in you make a curriculum change but you don't do due diligence when you're picking instructional resources or you have the program change and the resources and then we don't provide training to the staff so that they can adequately implement them. So my approach is always to look at things holistically to make sure we can support these changes. And if you need to talk about prioritizing something over something else, then you need to do that. But that's, that's part of the tough budget decisions that have to be made you know, um, around that. And really, at the core, is looking at what's best for students and getting students to a point where they can leave the Greenfield schools and go on and do whatever it is that they would like to do for their future. Um, so that is, um, that's how I would look at data for student performance and talk about um, capitalizing, you know, using resources. There's a lot of other pieces to improving student performance, but I'll keep it allocating resources. Many schools have been transitioning from using traditional discipline to a model of restorative justice where students are coached to resolve problems and make amends through communication and mediation. What's your picture of the school's role in addressing student conflicts and misbehavior? I think we have a huge role in addressing that because many times the schools are the area of most consistency and um, where many of our students spend the most time is with us in schools. And, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in my time as assistant superintendent and superintendent um, working with adverse data around adverse childhood experiences and um, trauma informed care and restorative practice. So, students are not going to come into our classrooms always ready to learn and feeling emotionally and physically safe to learn. They bring a lot with them when they come to us every day, even our youngest preschoolers. Um, I would assume Greenfield is not immune to having people who have experienced troubling times and not just COVID, but just in a general sense. So students come in with us having experienced a lot of challenges and so I believe that it is our responsibility to help them first feel physically safe. They need to know that they will be um, cared for physically, and that includes having good health services, having breakfast and lunch available for them, and then making sure that they feel emotionally supported. So establishing relationships with the adults in their environment, starting with their classroom teachers, all of the support staff in the district need to work with that as, as a priority. And then um, once students feel safe, they will begin to share some of their challenges. And when they do that, we will have less 
instances of students reacting from an emotional and dysregulated place. So um, I do not believe most students want to be disruptive. They do not want to have behavior that alienates their peers. Most students want to come to school and have a positive experience. So we need to provide them with resources to help them manage their emotions, regulate their emotions. Oftentimes we need to provide them with words, not just our little kids, you know, not just our preschool elementary students, sometimes our high school students have the hardest time articulating their emotions. Um, so we need to give them those tools and that means having all of the staff on board with using the same language and having the same philosophy about supporting students. Um, and then administratively we need to support the staff because that's a shift for some people in how they respond to student behavior in classrooms. And I think it's fair that they would not necessarily immediately see how it's beneficial to come away from the traditional and known disciplinary practices. Um, I believe that if you spend some time at the start of the year establishing structure and rules, that's a safety, a sense of safety and consistency. And then when students are not able to follow that, to have the conversation, what's happening, what can we help you with, and whether or not people necessarily espouse the belief that schools should be in that role, we are. It is just it's the facts of how things are right now. So um, I think that it is to our benefit, the benefit of our students, and you know the future of not just this community, but all communities to give the students the skills they need to be able to react with stressful and anxious situations as they move, move through life. And once they're feeling safe, physically and emotionally, they will be available to learn. And that's, that's our goal, is to get them available to learn. So, but that's not a quick overnight transition by any means, but. The lines between being an institution for learning and being a social service agency often get blurred. How have you navigated that in your career in education, and how do you mentor and advise less seasoned professionals in managing this reality in their own careers? Well, it's a very good segue from the last question. Um, it really goes back to um, what I was talking about in that students need to feel safe and secure in their environment. And schools now Again, whether you believe that this should be the case or not, it is our reality. And I believe that the more resources that we can provide for our students, the better that they will be able to access the high quality instruction that they can get here in Greenfield. So students who are experiencing tooth pain because they're not able to get to a dentist are not sitting in their math class trying to learn math. They're concentrating on the fact that they have a horrible toothache. So if we bring, um, you know, we have access to mobile dentists. And so if we facilitate mobile dentists a couple times a year, it's a minor disruption in the school day, but it can serve a huge need for our students. And you know, not to get off on the topic of dental health and overall physical health, but it's, it's bigger than just <laughs> Just one tooth, but, um, and, you know, having medical care available. Um, if parents are working second shift or it's a single parent family, they may not have the transportation available, may not have time when doctors, traditional doctor's offices are open to get students to a doctor for regular immunizations and for um, well child checks. So helping to facilitate structures that would make that easier for families, again, gives us, first of all, students can't even register without 
a physical without their immunizations, and we certainly do not want any child not to start school because they don't have their shots. So at times we need to help families access those resources because logistically it may be a challenge. Um, I work in a district now where there's no pediatrician in town. So we have health clinics in two of, two of the schools because we know that the students' physical health needs need to be addressed. Um, mental health service is a huge piece. Again, going back to the ACEs and trauma-informed care. Um, I'm, my experience is that many families don't disclose mental health issues in their families or in their students because of the stigma that it has carried. Um, but those mental health needs often affect a student's performance during the day whether it's peer relations, access to learning, attendance, which is a huge challenge. They're obviously not learning if they're not here. Um, and even if they are here, if they're worried about what's happening in other facets of their life, or they just come with anxiety. I mean, that's not just in the era of COVID, but in education in general, anxiety is huge. Transition years is, is big. Um, so helping students to have avenues to address those. And certainly if, if it's a bigger issue than school-based staff really are comfortable addressing, I believe that we should help families by providing referrals to resources, by networking in the communities to make sure that we have sufficient resources to, to offer to families. Um, I know that you have you know, um, youth services in town, um, connecting with them to see if we can facilitate um, programming, resources, summer camps, anything like that. Um, even if the schools are not physically providing the resource, I believe we should be able to provide some information to families about where they can go even I think it's, it would be very unfortunate for a family in a time of great need to reach out to someone who they've identified as a trusted adult in school to be told, sorry, I don't have that for you. I can't help you. It's okay if we can't do it, but we should be able to help them get there. So, and again, it all goes back to if they're not, if their basic needs are not taken care of, they will not be available to learn. So you good? I, I didn't address the advising other professionals. Do you want me to? Okay. Um, one of the things I think is the greatest challenge with um, either professionals who don't hold that belief or that they come from a place that didn't espouse that um, is trying to um, establish enough of a trusting relationship that they will follow your lead, follow the plan, and see the benefits for themselves. So working with other administrators or teachers or other staff that um, haven't had this tried and proven to be effective, um, certainly sharing success stories is, is one positive, especially if they can put a face to the name, um, but really, doing the work to establish some trusting relationships so that they'll give, they'll give your belief um, some credit and, and try, go along with you on the road to try and um, see how that plays out. Uh, so my question is, school, dis school districts are start planning a budget eight to 20 months in advance of the next year. How do you conceptualize a budget that far in advance? And if you find out you have a 500,000 shortfall in the middle of the year, what do you do? How do you cut or reduce? Okay. So conceptualizing the budget, um, my belief in terms of planning for the budget process is that we plan for supporting our students. You plan for the instructional program. You plan for um, 
facilities needs, you know, a five-year plan for facilities would be one way to address this. Um, technology refresh cycle that you have planned ahead so you know what's coming due in years two, three, four, and five. Um, looking at your instructional needs, how old are textbooks, how old are um, other resources that you have. Is there going to be the need to review curriculum? You have to have a curriculum revision cycle so you know what's coming up that may need to be reviewed, resulting in new instructional materials. Also looking at the priorities from the committee. And if you are supporting the work in restorative practice, which you might, um, then long term, we need to plan to keep the resources in district that support that work. So you build a budget assuming that those resources are in place. So um, you can't obviously plan for the unknown about you know, things that move, special education tuitions move, and you need to adjust for those things. Staffing, you need to adjust for. But you can begin to build the core of a budget multi years out, um, looking at general trends in increase, looking at um, you know your population. Is your population, do you have a bubble that's rolling up and you need to account for staffing? Are your gym floors going to need to be refinished and what does that look like? So really, I think the biggest way to do that is, is having these long-term plans set out um, and talking with you folks about this is the information that I have. What would you look to prioritize? Um, which is something you'd want to have built into the budget first, the gym floors or, or the other thing that needs to be dealt with. Um, working with the facilities folks, that's a big one. Facilities is always a big factor that you need to consider in the budgets because you know, oil tanks need to be replaced, hot water heaters need to be replaced, all of a uh, system of when you're gonna paint and redo floors, all, all of those things. Um, so advanced planning is definitely a key. And then just very pragmatically, year to year, um, I begin working with my department heads just before Thanksgiving to say, start looking at what you need, what's gonna be renewed, what are we changing? How are you going through resources? What does the photocopy paper look like already? And let's you know, estimate out. Um, biology always needs their materials. That's not gonna be a surprise, but let's get that budgeted. So really, um, before or just around the Christmas break, um, I think you begin, certainly that would be contingent on timing in Greenfield, but, um, a few months ahead, we really create the, the structure. And then um, I believe that I should be keeping the committee updated on any significant budget changes that we see, certainly budget reports um, at school committee meetings, talking to you about significant changes or this broke, that broke, we're gonna need to account for that. Um, all of those things, you know, I'm, um, I believe I'm transparent with the committee about. So um, if there is a shortfall in the middle of the year, um, then that is a conversation that I would have with my administrative team to start talking about, let's talk about some recommendations. Where can we look at this budget to make some changes? And then um, I believe I should bring recommendations to you folks to consider because often a budget change in the middle of the year is going to affect programming or other resources that you've prioritized. So we need to make those decisions together about how to address those. The citizens in our community demand value for their tax dollars and transparency and fiscal accountability. In this light, tell us about how you have ensured that the budget you propose and the financial plan that you oversee as approved by the school committee is as compact and efficient as possible. Well, one way I do that is by starting before Thanksgiving <laughs> and I meet with 
first of all, I look at the current year's budget. How are we trending? How are things looking? Um, if we're not using as much photocopy paper as we thought, then we make adjustments in what we're looking for the following year. Um, we um, have, I have conversations with the administrators and would continue to do the same about what are the absolute essential things first that you need to make these programs run? What are the essentials that you need to meet student needs? And that includes facilities and medical. Um, it includes all departments in the district. And then we look at it comprehensively. Um, if there's staff at one building that may not be running a full schedule and we're a little short at another building, we talk about how can we share staff instead of asking for new staff. Um, looking at the talents of people across the board. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you? Oh, I, that's okay. I'm glad that's what you said instead of anything else that you could have said. <laughs> um, so really looking at, we've, you know, I've done things like, um, looking at district-wide site licenses instead of every building doing their own site license. Um, I believe we should be ordering supplies collectively and not every teacher putting in a separate supply order. Those are small, small things, but when you go from the potential of every teacher requesting 20 boxes of pencils and 30 highlighters to the building is now asking for X many pencils. Um, sometimes the teachers want three pencils and you can share a box instead of everybody having their own box. Obviously a very micro example, but um, I believe that all the district department heads that have a budget to oversee need to be part of the discussion about building or reducing the budget. Um, let's look at what we have what can we collectively as an administrative team talk to the committee about reducing or why do we need this to remain in the district um, an example the high school principal may feel very strongly that elementary math tutors need to stay in the district because historically our students are struggling when they get into ninth grade math it doesn't serve even the high school principal to reduce resources for math instruction because we know that addressing a math deficit in second grade is going to be a much different type of endeavor than it would be trying to get a student who's now in ninth grade to gain all those skills back. Um, so those are the types of discussions I believe in holistically looking at resources so then when I am presenting you the budget it's this is what's necessary these are the changes that we are proposing this is why things are the way they are um, and here's where we can change if we have low class sizes and we have a retirement then maybe we don't need to fill that position that year because the committee has prioritized a nurse so you, you have to be flexible, but I do not believe that the departments should be working in isolation because we are creating a district program. Jean, I'm going to I'm just going to interject for a second. Oh we my. have we have about um, 30 minutes left, so I think we're doing great on time. We should be okay. fine. I can talk more if you'd like. <laughs> you are doing great. OK. <laughs> I'll talk forever. <laughs> In this rural region, there are few school transportation businesses. With limited options, what model would you recommend? District ownership or contracting for transportation services or something else? What are the advantages and disadvantages of these options? And what can be done to address high transportation costs? Well, I believe that we would need to do a lot of research before I could give you an educated answer to that question. 
So certainly there are benefits to having a transportation company in that the insurance needs, the maintenance of buses, all the logistics that go along with a company um, would be borne by the transportation company, including their staff costs, um, all their insurance, and creating all the bus routes <laughs> would be borne by someone else. So that is quite a responsibility that would move outside of the district. Um, that's the model I use, and I'm fortunate to have a transportation company that is very easy to deal with and has done a wonderful job. Having your own bus ownership, you have control over how you route the drivers that you have um, and how you utilize the resources that come with having a transportation company. You can, um, you can source out to other neighboring districts and let them, for a small fee, ride your buses if that works logistically. Um, but with that comes the challenge of having to deal with the staff and drivers who are out sick and all of the training that goes with that, um, having to carry the insurance and the fuel costs, which fluctuate constantly. Um, so, and maintenance of buses, which, you know, they're expensive. So there's, there's definitely pros and cons that even right my initial response to the question I can see pros and cons to both um, but I would need to get a lot more information to have some conversations with bus companies what can you offer um, talk with other districts that own their own transportation I know that um, Greenfield does some of their own transportation and um, I heard some of the positives and some of the challenges that go along with that so um, getting the opportunity to gather some information and then present to the committee those pros and cons and then um, working with you about what resources do you want to commit you know if you work with an outside vendor you're entering into a multi-year contract and then you don't have your own buses so if that contract's not working out you have fewer options um, to work with and you know generally the expense of creating your own bus fleet would be monumental so once you have a contractor that's sort of a long-term investment but having your own bus company is a long-term investment because you've put all that money into buying buses and so um, what do you do with those buses if you decide to move to a contractor so there's a lot of logistics um, and then you have to look at the you know the space that you're dealing with how many buses would be needed. It could be a financial win, loss, or push to, depending which model you have and which one you go to. Um, transportation is always, um, I think that's a challenging factor to deal with regardless of what model you go with. Um, as I said, fuel costs fluctuate significantly, can have a huge impact on the budget. Um, generally issues occur on buses student issues happen on buses um, there are concerns about bus stops how do you work with that run times um, so parents are concerned rightly so when they feel like their children are not um, at a safe bus stop they're not um, they're on the bus too long um, so there are there are definitely challenges that come regardless of which model you know the superintendent's office always deals with concerns about transportation no matter who's riding who's driving the bus um, so i think some of the biggest ways to at least consider addressing high cost of transportation is um, you know looking at the runs are the runs the most efficient that they could be monitoring time that students are on them can you partner with another district if you're going to some you know, specialized programs? Can we pick somebody else up or can they pick us up on the way? Um, so those are some fairly common ways to address high, high costs. Um, even working with other local districts, does another district have a special education program that would meet the needs of our students? 
and it's not as far away as another program that we've been using, um, can we meet their needs closer to home? And certainly that's not a superintendent decision. It's a, it's a team decision for that student, but something to think about is, you know, do we have those kinds of options? So, it's a tough one. Currently in Greenfield, we have a school resource available at the police station, but not housed in our school buildings. As superintendent, would you continue this practice? What role, if any, do you see for school resource officers in our schools? So I know this one's a challenging question for Greenfield. Um, I've had some feedback today about the role and the history. So um, my personal experience with school resource officer is um, pretty dramatically different from what I understand has been some of the history here. Um, so really, here's my philosophy. A school resource officer, I do not believe should be in a school to be involved in student discipline. I do not believe that policing, arrests, um, law enforcement activities in their purest sense should happen in a school, unless there's an imminent safety issue, somebody has a weapon, et, et cetera. Um, I believe that school staff should be the primary people who are addressing student needs, which is why um, I believe that we should have mental health people, whether it's adjustment counselors, guidance counselors, social workers that can um, assess our students' needs, um, I have been um, very lucky that I've been able to participate in a lot of um, safety training and student threat assessment and needs assessments. Um, my goal being to better create resources in the district that can support our students struggling with those things. I don't think that first level of assessment needs to be a law enforcement job. Um, that we have to train our staff to recognize signs and symptoms of mental health challenges in our students and that we need to give them places to refer our students so that they can get whatever support. It could be a transient issue, it could be a long-term issue, but we need to have resources available to respond fairly quickly to a student in crisis regardless um, of why they're dealing with that. I am fortunate to have those resources. I am also fortunate to have a very positive school resource officer experience where the school resource officer is really part of our safe school climate work and their role primarily is to establish positive relationships with the students. Um, any law enforcement activities are done by other officers in the police department, not our SRO. Um, and any questioning of students when the need has come up is done outside of the school buildings. So one, I would need to establish a good relationship with the police department to have conversations about that and how they see a school resource, resource officer because if the philosophy is diametrically opposed, then that's, um, that's one type of conversation. Although I do know that the police department here is moving or has mental health support that um, is in the police department. So that's, that's very positive, in my opinion, that is a positive thing for, for Greenfield. Um, so you have the conversation. You also need to, I would need to have conversations with the administrators. What was their perception of the school resource officer with families when, um, because as a new superintendent, I would want to have parents give, given the opportunity to come in and talk to me, meet with me, talk to me about their experiences and priorities. Um, and given that this is a question for your superintendent finalists, obviously this has been um, a priority topic for you. So what do parents think about the school resource officer? Um, I know from experience they can be very helpful in working with students who um, are making bad choices that are um, 
that have resisted the intervention of mental health professionals. They have also been very supportive and um, very informational to parents who feel at their wits end. Um, but again, that's the philosophy of using them as a resource and not a disciplinarian. But if the experience of people in Greenfield has been negative, um, then I think that's something that would need to be considered and potentially some time given where resources are expanded in the schools and um, that I get to know the community resource officer and talk with them and see how they support families um, because I'm sure a lot of the families they're interacting with outside of school have students in our schools. So, you know, what, what kind of relationship can we establish in that realm? You know, um, the Greenfield schools can have resources here to support students with a variety of needs um, without a school resource officer but my experience has been positive. So I think it's, it's really a community decision. Thank you. So we've reached the end of our questions mm -hmm. and you have an opportunity at this point, if you'd like to give a closing statement, feel, feel free to do that. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome to ask any questions of us that you might have. Okay, um, a question first, if I may. Today, when I had the opportunity to meet with a variety of stakeholder groups across the day, which I greatly appreciated everyone giving their time, I very clearly heard from them that communication, special education, curriculum, um, those were priority areas. Would the committee um, agree with those? Would you expand on those to any other areas? Anyone like to take that one? I mean, I'll spitball. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, part of what you heard is we've had a really difficult, the past year has been really difficult with communicating with the community. It's a lot of communicating. Um, and I, that was, we've all acknowledged that multiple times in conversations. We've acknowledged it, you know, when our, in our meetings. And it's been really difficult for everyone. So yes, there's absolutely a need to up our communication. Since um, interim superintendent has taken over, that has been a complete reversal, at least as far as I'm concerned, and I do okay. have kids in the um, school district. I don't know if, and how anyone else feels about that, but I do, I, my sense is that there has been a sigh of relief because there has been so much more communication. Okay. Um, and as for special education, I actually have a child who has special needs and was part of the revival of the special education parent advisory committee, which right. all led to me sitting here today. Oh, um, good. And <laughs> yes, our um, special education needs are, are substantial and it, it's going to take a lot of work to get the services that our kids really need. Um, we, we have, there's always a different philosophy based on a new special education director or director of people services that comes in and we've had several within the last, just within memory, I, six, oh. since my daughter has been in the school district. Okay. So pretty and significant she's a, turnover. And she's going to be a sophomore. So, um, there are certainly needs, um, uh, what was the other, uh, the, Core curriculum. Oh, the core curriculum. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. We have, um, it's, it's, and someone please stop me or correct me. Um, it's, we've been, the elementary schools have kind of worked in silos. And what happens then when they get to the middle school, there's a, you can tell which okay. school a kid went to based on what they bring into the classroom knowledge wise, which is okay. terrible. I mean, it's, it's just, not where we want. It's not, yeah, it's not ideal. Um, and so I absolutely believe that there are a lot of improvements that could be made related to curriculum. Okay. Um, just, I just want to expand on that. Susan's right. Those are our, you know, main core directives at the moment. But for me, and I'm going to speak for myself sitting here on this committee and as a parent, as a community member, all of those things lead to unification. And I'm certain we spoke about this in your first interview as well, yeah. that 
what has been made very clear in a year of a pandemic and um, a lot of other really huge social issues happening is that we are not unified as a town, as a community of schools, as a community of educators, or even ourselves sitting here on this committee all the time. And that for me, the leader I'm looking for is going to use those things like curriculum and restorative practice and um, special ed department leadership to create a unified town. Sure, we're gonna have different beliefs, but we're all moving towards one goal and it doesn't always feel that way right now. Okay. Um, and I think our community would agree and that part of that problem is a communication issue. And if we're using all of those tools together, mm -hmm. we will get there. And I think every person sitting here and every person in the community wants what's best. We just haven't figured out a road to get there together yet. And okay. that's my hope in a superintendent is person driving us down that road together. Okay. Hi. Oh, there you go. So I said hi. Definitely better. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't have children in the schools or family in the schools. And I have particular interest in uh, school budgeting and finance because I'm interested in sort of what you were saying. At the end of the day, we're here to make sure children get an education so that when they leave, they can have a good life. And how do we use money that way? Mm -hmm. So I I'm sure what my sense of the community is that what you heard is what a lot of people talk about. Um, looking at how we use budget is an interest of mine. I was very interested in, um, I'm generally the person on the committee that talks about having a multi-year curriculum plan, a multi-year technology plan, a multi-year capital plan, a multi, you know, again, predictive okay. ability, mm -hmm. don't change the budget format every year because then you can't go back and predict, you know, see really what your trend was and, so I, I think some, um, I think it's very, this is my just personal opinion, when, when business managers change, I think it's easy for people to come in and say, I like it this way, I like it that way. So I think having some, some predictive ability with budget that uh, really does plan for some of these issues that are so important would be something I think is important to address. I was, um, I came here to interview to be a school committee member because I was applying for an appointment and before me was um, a group of teachers who were coming in to present about the civics curriculum um, because of course the state had kind of revised everything and Greenfield needed a plan for a civics curriculum and we didn't have an assistant superintendent for curriculum and so they were kind of piecing it together frankly very you know, as well as they could, but they, you know, they had all the responsibilities as teachers. And so I think, yes, it's true. We want to move towards a vision of having a curriculum really from pre-K up through 12 that's aligned and, and that has guidance. And we're, we're so happy to have just hired an assistant superintendent for curriculum and really hope for a superintendent who will be able to work as a team and, and help to, to build up and strengthen that muscle for us. Those are all really good comments. Um, the only thing I would add to your list that y I didn't hear you mention um, as, as a part of what you've heard today or in your, in your answers today, okay. um, our pay structure across the board is not competitive compared to neighboring districts. Okay. And uh, at least for me as a school committee member, that's a really critical thing that it ties into the budget it ties into i mean it ties into everything Absolutely. because you don't necessarily recruit and retain the talent that you need mm -hmm. if you're not paying competitively right. so we are uh, prioritizing that in terms of what we can impact as school committee members and okay. yeah and working quite a bit on that and i'm sure you're familiar with uh the the union environment that takes some uh, finagling yeah yeah but that is one thing that I know we come back to and as a school committee specifically um, we spend a ton of time on it but it makes it kind of makes sense that you wouldn't have heard that today because it's not some it, we're in executive session when we're talking about right. it we're not talking about that as much in the the, the public sessions of our, right. of our meetings so I would add that as well Okay. Um, and Jean, you're good? Okay. 
anything else question wise for us, please? We've got time. But don't feel like you're pre obligated no either. Okay, let me think of one. Um, no, I mean, I think really what, what you folks just talked about is really reflective what I heard all day today. Um, and just to share, I've done collective bargaining very su successfully um, where we, I'm pleased to have very positive relationships with all my unions right now. So that's something that I definitely think is an important um, relationship to foster within limits, um, you know. But um, no, I don't think off the top of my head. I mean, I know Greenfield just saw some athletic success, girls softball, I believe. They did really well this okay. year. Yes, they um, did. And our hockey team, they went, they were state champs? They were state champs before COVID hit. We didn't do state champs. Oh, right. Okay. But even like a lot of our, our track team only lost one game before COVID. That's amazing. Yeah. So. The sports are kind of quiet. Yes. Field hockey is pretty good too. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, I was told today that you folks don't have a social media presence really. Like I, would, no I would say that's page. accurate. Okay, yeah. is that something the that... The schools have them like our curriculum in silos. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it, in fact, you know, that's a great thing to just briefly talk about. Um, I actually had a question about that that didn't make the cut when I made up the final question. <laughs> okay. Um, everyone else's questions were so much more intellectual than mine were, oh. you know. I want to know your favorite I'm very color. pragmatic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, we did have, uh, TMS has uh, uh, done a consulting uh, for yeah. us on uh, strategic communications, um, and uh, Justin has done a, an entire audit of mm -hmm. our uh, media and communications presence, including the Great. social media, well. and now we just have to figure out how to actually implement that, and he's given us some, some good ideas. Um, I, I'm very thankful that uh, we're, you know, we're not one of the school districts that has to have a conversation about changing their mascot. Um, our, <laughs> you know, we are the green wave, which mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, a, a nice thing to, to implement and uh, very uh, benign in terms of, you know. That's great. Yeah, yeah. You can focus on other things and And it and looks that. really cool on, on letterhead, the green wave. So, great. you know, I'm cool with it. I sat on a coffee cup earlier. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. I almost wear my sweatshirt. I'm really glad. I usually wear a hoodie, and I'm really glad I didn't wear it tonight. I'd be sitting here sweating. Warm. But yes, very yeah, warm. I did have my Green Wave sweatshirt out to wear, and then I remembered there's oh. no air conditioning in here. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, Christine, would you like to make any sort of clothing statement? Before clothing we, statement? Closing okay. statement. Oh, closing. Oh. <laughs> you were talking about your hoodie. Oh. <laughs> you want to do a follow-up? Yeah. Sure. Sorry to go back, I'm okay. but uh, remember Johnson Musad has a follow-up. Yeah. That's totally fine. It's a, we wrote really long questions for you, <laughs> and one of the one questions was about the relationship with the school committee. Mm -hmm. uh, could you, uh, just repeating the last part of the question, can you describe some situations where the roles and responsibilities between the administration and the school committee have challenged you and how you would work to address them where you are superintendent? Yes, I'm thinking of what's reasonable to share. Um, so some small things, but I think they're fairly um, illustrative of the conversations. Um, I had a fairly new member who's been, she's very active, very interested, very um, invested in the schools. And we were having conversations about potential budget reductions that we had to make. I did have a year where um, I had to make almost a million and a half dollars worth of cuts. So that was about 12 staff people. That was a very challenging night. Um, and some of the members of the board um, in their absolute anxiety about having to make some of these cuts um, began talking about we should do can drives to recycle. We should do um, different fundraisers. We should do, you know, all of these 
great ideas, but they weren't going to save a million and a half dollars off the budget. And so we had a conversation about, I appreciate the ideas and I appreciate the struggle and the horror of having to vote on these reductions, but the principals will deal with can drives and whatever else to support student activities because that's really what those types of activities are great for. Um, but we need to look at this $28 million budget and cut a million and a half dollars out of it. So if we could go a little bit bigger picture, I think that would be probably more productive for this conversation. And then that member called me and talked to me about other fundraisers and can drives, which is fantastic. Um, but I know that that was a discussion had just in, in in pain for the conversation that had to come out. Um, but I will have conversations similar to those things, you know, um, when you work in a very small community and people have, their, their children are in the schools and they hear things from a parent lens, sometimes those questions come out in, in their committee work. So, you know, um, when is the copy of the final schedule coming out, you know, I'll have the principal send that to you in an email. That's not really a school committee superintendent sort of task, but you know, I try to respond to those types of things by filtering it to the appropriate place. Um, and talking about, you know, thank you for that suggestion. I will talk to the administrative team about whether that's possible or not. Um, and certainly we could bring information back to the committee to talk about, you know, um, so always the questions and the suggestions come from a good place. Nobody's really trying to do my job. Nobody wants to do my job. Um, so they're asking because they're trying to help meet student needs and it, it's hard. I mean, you folks would be really putting your trust in somebody else to run your business and that's that's a lot um, I recognize that so um, those are some of the ways and sometimes if it's more helpful we'll have a phone conversation or a meeting but I always try to meet with new members and talk about you know what are you hoping what's your preferred communication style things along those lines so we get a feel for each other um, early on, so that was that helpful. Okay. I for I forgot to go back for the follow up questions. Sorry, but oh. we we're actually now out of time. So that uh, I apologize. I apologize to the committee. Um, okay. I didn't have any follow up, so of course it, you know, it's all about me, right? <laughs> So we are at the end of our time. Mm -hmm. I appreciate so much you spending time with us and our school district today. Um, and I look forward to um, seeing where, where this process takes us all. And I appreciate your um, interest mm -hmm. in Greenfield. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of your time and um, the opportunity to meet with people here. It was, it was a wonderful day. So great. I look Thank forward you. to hearing back from you folks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Member Karen. Second. Second from Member Extra. Glenn, you weren't quick enough. Um, <laughs> any objections? We are adjourned at 7.15. Good job. <laughs>